Welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglis Guitar Show. Today, let's check out an early 2000s Gibson ES335. We actually unboxed this on the show a couple of months ago, and I decided I'm gonna go ahead and clean it up and do a review and demo on it because I've been branching out and doing quite a few different style of Gibson instruments. So why don't we learn a little bit about 335s and their history today? Well, we're not talking the, the 50s history. I mean, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit, but we're talking the, the kind of confusing history. What happened after Kalamazoo? Nobody ever talks about that. So let's start this journey by first taking a look at this beautiful early 2000s ES-335. Last time I left you guys was, oh man, look at the flame sides on this guitar. Early 2000s is a fantastic era for Les Paul standards, and apparently it must not have been too shabby for 335s either. I've yet to find a 335 that has a more actively moving flame side than this one. Like the top, it's okay, right? It's a nice 335 figured. In the back, it's got some stuff going on, but for me, it's all about the sides on this one. So let's go ahead and dive into 335 history here. First introduced in 1958, solid body guitars were kind of newish. I mean, they've been around for a while at this point, but they were still trying to convert old world people that knew the arch top guitars and acoustic guitars kind of into that whole electric guitar market. I mean, that's kind of what they've done here. Semi hollow, they've got the F holes like they're used to, but it's all electric. They've got that center block in here now to kind of reduce some of the feedback that the true hollow bodies have. That way you could play these on stage with really big loud amps later on with some distortion and whatnot too. So generally speaking, 335s were made in Kalamazoo in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the early 80s. Kalamazoo shuts down in 1984. However, 335s changed drastically in all those eras from the types of necks they used, whether they had the whole Mickey Mouse ears or more so like the ones that we're looking at today as far as their double cutaways. There's stop bar varieties. There's some fancy vibrolas from the sideways trims to all the other different systems that you're seeing here. Then you've got the 60s and 70s ones where they have a whole trapeze style bridge, which some guys like them, some guys don't. And then in the mid 70s, there's even some models that have maple necks out there. But after Kalamazoo closed, what happened to the 335s? Well, they moved to Nashville. They just had Nashville for a while. So they started to make them there from the mid 80s until the early 2000s when Gibson opened up Gibson Memphis. So then you had a couple of years there where they were just Gibson Memphis made instruments. You can see a couple of examples here. But around 2003, 2004-ish, Memphis gets blended in within the custom shop division. So that kind of makes it hard to identify some 335s, like are they reissues or are they just custom shop? I mean, these were high leveled instruments regardless. So it's kind of like a custom shop Les Paul standard at that point. But Memphis had a great run. Its closing was announced in late 2018. So that's a good 17 years. So that brings us up to modern day. Starting in the year 2020, they brought these back to Nashville instead of being made in Memphis, and they started expanding their whole lineup. That's when they brought things back like the Epiphone Casinos that they're also making in the USA now. So now that we know about some of the different types that are out there, how exactly do you tell? The best way is to look at the serial number. So if you look back here, and you have a serial number that's impressed into the headstock, you should be able to date the guitar based on that. So this particular one is a 2003. So this is made within that whole place when they weren't quite custom shops yet. They hadn't blended in. It was just like slightly before that. So it's within that whole limbo period for this particular one that we're looking at today. That's why I thought it was important to document it now that I know about all the different types. But anyways, you're actually going to want to take notice of your last three digits of your serial number, this particular one being 720. Now there's many different ways you can analyze that. That's why it's important that I just gave you that guide of where they were made because the 50s ones, they're not gonna have serial numbers like that. The traditional serial number that we were just looking at was not invented until 1977. So prior to that, you're going to have serial numbers that look like these in the 50s or this in the 60s or late 60s. So if yours does not have an impressed serial number and you believe it to be truly vintage, it probably is. I mean, look inside your sound hole, you should see a sticker there that'll help you on the more vintage ones or you see like an ink stamp serial somewhere. Factory order numbers, those should help you. But once you get into the 70s and the 80s, trying to figure out are you Nashville or Kalamazoo build, 
you're going to look at those numbers. So Kalamazoo will be 499 or less. A Nashville made one would be higher than that, 500 plus. So mainly you're going to see Kalamazoo build ones. So using that serial number format, if we looked at this, 720, okay, that means it's Nashville made, right? Well, using those numbers, yes, but no, this is a Memphis made one. So once Kalamazoo gets shut down, they kind of start flip-flopping stuff. So if you're pre-1975, 499 or less, Kalamazoo, 500 plus, Nashville. But once Memphis opens, 499 or less becomes Nashville, and 500 plus means Memphis. That's a basic general gist. So if you need help identifying your 335, that's what my private help sessions on my website are for. Or there are tons of free options available as well online. Just post your guitar to some guitar form and I'm sure somebody can help you there. But this one, as I was telling you earlier, one of those early Memphis made ones. It definitely feels a lot different from the later Memphis ones that I felt. It almost has like a D-shaped neck to it. That's that one feature that made me want to feature this in its own episode because it's got so much shoulder to the neck and I thought somebody might like that. Very flat on the back, it'd be great for jazzy stuff. But anyways, I hope I didn't bore you too much with the details and you found that information semi-what helpful. Obviously, I'm not an expert on 335, so that's just my understanding of it. Feel free to correct me if I was wrong anywhere. But let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside the 335, now that I got it all polished up, let's check it out. So starting with our pickups. Could be wrong, but these look like 57 classics to me from this era. They say patent applied for on the back. However, there were a lot of different pickups in this era that looked very similar. But generally, the burst buckers would have like a little sticker that says Alnico 5 magnets or whatnot. But another way to tell is by looking at our pickup readings. We get 7.57k ohms in our bridge position and our neck. A little bit hotter at that, 7.67. Middle position just for fun, 3.81. So yeah, that pretty much looks like 57 classics to me. But pickups aside, let's take a look at our pickup cavities. Pretty standard stuff in here. You can see all the woods that construct it, as well as our neck tenon right here. So if you've never seen inside of a 335 before, the way they make them is it's a maple poplar laminated sandwich of woods. Maple poplar maple. So they have those three layers of wood there, and then they put that on top of a spruce bracing. And then inside here, we have a center block of maple. Now it's easier to see right here. But that's what makes a 335 a 335 as compared to like a 330, is because they actually have a maple center block in them to cut down on the feedback. You can see that maple block right there, and then on the bottom side, you also have another spruce bracing. That bracing helps us get that slight top carve to it. And what you're seeing down here, once again, is the spruce bracing on the underside. So technically, these are laminate construction. You have to get like a really high-end L5 before they don't do the maple poplar maple sandwiches. Through a toggle switch here, two volumes, two tones, output jack on the front. This particular version comes with a true Gibson ABR-1 that has a bridge wire retainer, so you don't lose your saddles. Then we have a regular full weight tailpiece here. I don't think I'll break out the endoscope on this one since we could see it through the F-hole. And we've dove into enough 335s recently, but this one does have a special little decal serial in here. Or sound hole sticker, as it's more apropos to call it. So you've got your serial number here, which dates it to 2,321st day of the year. Production number 720, but you gotta remember all those numbers start at 500. So it's really like the 220th guitar made that day. Then you have your model ES335.VS. I believe VS stands for Vintage Sunburst, which definitely is what this finishes. And dot refers to the dot neck region issue. 335s are those one guitars where you actually want dots instead of fancier block inlays. As far as the condition, we have lots of nicks and dings right here on this top corner. Somebody was playing and had something dinging against it. Then we have a little bit of hazing to the finish in this area just because that's where somebody's like deodorant was left on the guitar. That's right, deodorant will eat your guitar, be careful, because normally your arm will like rest right here and then over time it can haze the finish over. Mosquito spray, other bug sprays, alcohol will do that as well, so be careful what you spill on your guitar. You've got an impression line right there and just some other nicks and dings scattered across the top. It cleaned up pretty nicely. 
This was definitely a gigged guitar though, because somebody was trying to plug in and ended up hitting it here, 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 you know, quite a few locations. But underneath our pick guard, things are looking pretty good. You can kind of see like a delaminating finish area right there because that's where the bracket sits on it. So it's kind of uh, popped the finish, I guess you could say. But that gets covered over by the pick guard once you put it back on. Speaking of the pick guard, might as well take a look at it. It just looks like this. It's got some scratches on it. Multi, multi ply, fancy. And there's that big bracket I was talking about, how it rests against the top right there. And it looks like that one's back installed. So moving on from our body, we have a mahogany neck with a rosewood fretboard, 22 medium jumbo frets. I just polished those guys up and conditioned the fretboard. We've got the acrylic dot inlay. And then this thing actually has quite considerable fret wear within like the first seven. I think you can see what we were talking about right there, especially on the second fret. That's a pretty sizable ding but you're definitely within level recrown territory if you want a skilled luthier to take care of that for you. But these frets are nice and polished. They should be good to go for a while yet. We'll have to see if that affects playability or not. I'm betting probably not at this point in time anyways. But now what I'm most curious about is the neck. So 1.69 inches at the nut, and we got 2.07 by the 12th. First fret neck depth of 0.87, then by the 12th, 0.9. Man, that's a skinny neck. It's got a flat back to it with a bit of shoulder, definitely a D-shaped neck, but let's go ahead and check that out on the contour gauge. There we go, this does a beautiful job at showing you that D-shape in the neck. So this is at the first fret. You can see it still has a little bit of a roundedness to it, but still kind of flat. But then by the 12th, there really is just a completely flat area, and then you just get your shoulders. So that's a D-shaped neck if I've ever seen one. Which I won't lie, it's not my favorite feeling neck on a 335. But then again, I'll have to play it before I do my final judgment. I never noticed this before until today, but there is like a small line forming between the binding and the neck. I mean, it kind of looks like a crack, but I don't think it's actually a crack. I think it's just like a light separation and then some of the finish started to chip, but you can just barely feel that. I do want you to be aware of that. Then there's like a little lacquer bubbling spot right there. And something that's pretty common on 2000s Gibsons are the fret nibs start to form a gap and your string can get caught. This example has that very lightly, but some examples get really bad and just like completely stuck and you have to pry it out. I mean, I didn't notice it while playing this one, but it definitely is there if you try to get it in there. Far from the worst example of that, but that is something to be aware of on 2000s Gibsons because almost every single one gets them. Then you can either choose to refret it to get rid of that or just fill it in. Moving on to the face of the headstock, there is like a patch of pretty deep scratches here. I tried using a scratch remover to get those out, but no luck there. They're a little bit too deep. However, you can only just barely feel them with your nail. But the truss rod's looking good. You've got the threads just slightly past the top of the nut. So plenty of life left there. And then you can see your Gibson logo, Mother of Pearl crown. Just lots of nicks and dings and scratches on this headstock. Somebody probably left those strings long and as they, they were tuning it up, it would scratch it here and just scratch it as they were playing. But as far as the truss rod cover itself, it's just black plastic. Moving on to the back. This cleaned up pretty well too. Let's take a second to go over our condition here in case you're interested in being the next owner. You got some more dings just like you had on the top. I'd say the worst area is right here. It looks like a strap was left on the guitar and it just rested on it and kind of slightly ate at the finish. You can't really feel it as much anymore, but you can see those marks right there. I used a scratch remover in that area and that kind of helped make it feel more normal. But you can see some scratches from a strap. There's some impression marks back here, some buckle worming, nicks and dings, not perfect by any means. But if you're buying this one, it's because it's a beautiful color. It's a pretty awesome top, but you know, it, it's all about the sides on this one. Like it's just absolutely fantastic how much the sides move. It's, it's really ridiculous. Like it's to the point where I would contemplate keeping this one, but it's got other nicks and dings. And it truly is more so player's grade than collector. And down here you get a little bit of stand rash and a line right there where the pieces of the side meet together. Going around the other side now, just as equally as flamed. Man, they just, they just did a fantastic job with the side of this one. But I'd say the uh, treble side's in much better condition than the uh, base side. But there, once again, you can see some light stand rash. So very cool 335 figured here. I hope this 
bench segment kind of helps show off the sides of it a little bit more. It's definitely my favorite part about this one. Now we'll go up the back of the neck, as is common in the late 90s, early 2000s. You get the dark heel, but they don't like burst the rest of the headstock or anything. So as far as nicks, dings, and impressions, you got like a small impression right there. And maybe another small one right here when you get in the light just right. But moving up the back side of our headstock, we've got our Grover tuners, which are very nice, and a serial number. Sometimes reissue style 335s, if they have the sticker on the inside, they won't actually get it on the headstock. So that's something else that can kind of tell you where your guitar was made potentially. But you can also see some red right here. I'm guessing that was a reaction to some sort of a clip-on tuner. But this one was made in 2003. Go ahead and check it out under black light real quick. Everything's looking pretty good on the top. Even our knobs are glowing just a hair. I mean, it's a 2003, almost 20 years old at this point. You would expect some sort of a glow, but you can see some light clear coat wear in that area where the guy's arm was resting. Binding has a bit of a glow to it, but then when you get to the face of the headstock, everything's looking good here. Besides obviously our scratched area right there. Backside, we get a little bit of a sweat absorption area right there, and maybe some sweat right there by the strap. Other than that, looking pretty good. Our neck has a very nice even glow as well. Doesn't look like any stand rash up here, which is kind of interesting, seeing as we have it on the side. But there you can see the uh, discoloration I was talking about earlier. Something discolored the finish. It's kind of peculiar that you see it on the back, but none on the front. But there you can see those stand rash areas on the edge. All said and done, this one weighs eight pounds, 7.1 ounces. I'm really surprised by that because this feels way heavier than that. That must mean our distribution is off. It's a body heavy guitar making it feel a lot heavier than that. But anyways, let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how this one sounds. All right, let's go ahead and go through some basic tones here. We'll start with our neck pickup. say I really like the punchiness of the neck position on this one. It's still very nice and deep, but very articulate. <laughs> and obviously the middle pickup does its stuff too. And the bridge pickup should sound pretty good with some distortion. Try some distortion.
Now that we know about this particular version of a Gibson ES-335, what are my final thoughts on this one? Not my favorite 335 I've ever had, but that doesn't mean it was bad. It was just more so for me, the neck profile shape just is not what I like generally. But if you like a D-shaped neck, yeah, definitely check one of these early 2000s ones out. For me, I thought it was all about the neck pickup on this one. I really enjoyed that. The bridge pickup also had some good tones, but this is just an absolutely beautiful example. I mean, from the flame on the top, that's, you know, pretty all right, to the very nice on the back but I really cannot sing enough praises for the side piece of maple that they used on this thing. On top of that, it's just the color. I wish the entire color of this was just that tiger brown that they've got going on here. So troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed learning some of the differences between the different eras of 335s and where they were created. I'm sure I'll keep documenting more of these so we get a better understanding of them all. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.